Today we're going to start a new sermon series here at Round Prairie. And um, you know, if you've been here, you know we like to preach sermon series. And the reason for that is it's easier on me. No, no, not really. Okay, that's not the only reason. The reason for that is I think it's important that we get um, more than just one day about a certain thing. We, we love to learn how the Bible is put together here at Round Prairie. You know, one of the things that we as a staff have talked about repeatedly, really for the last seven years, Chris and I have been here the longest, but we've all talked about it repeatedly, is we have a strong desire for the body of believers here to be biblically literate. We want you to understand how the Bible fits together, what the message of the Bible truly is, and how God's redemptive story has been told for centuries. That this Christianity thing is not just something that's a great fad, But God has been orchestrating this thing since before the creation of time. And the story of Scripture is the story of redemption. And and really these sermon series hopefully give you all a better idea of how the story is put together. And so today we're going to be starting another sermon series. And this is kind of our summer sermon series. We try to do one series through the summer. So it's going to be about 11 or 12 weeks weeks long. And um, it's going to be over the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Now, now, the way this came about is we are praying right now about the possibility of a major building program here at Round Prairie. That's what these pictures on the sides are and the floor plans is to get us to pray about that over the next couple of weeks. And we'll come back as a church in about two weeks and vote on whether or not to proceed with these plans, okay? And so y'all be thinking about that, praying about that. But in the process of talking about it, someone told me, you know, I had a pastor one time when we were doing a building program, he preached through Nehemiah. And man, I just couldn't get that out of my head and I couldn't get it out of my heart. And so I just began to pray and look and I said, you know what, I think that's what we need to preach next. Now, what's funny about Nehemiah is it is about building, okay? But it's not just about building a building. This whole series is not going to be about buildings because there's a lot of things in this world that are broken down, Amen. So we call this series Rebuild because the reality is, is if you look at the story of Nehemiah in the Bible, you're going to find a story about a man who is going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down. They had been built before, but they have been broken down, and he is going to go back and rebuild them. And we'll talk a little more about that. There's going to be some history today, so don't yawn and go to sleep on me, okay? If your neighbor goes to sleep, slap them, okay? But... But, but when I look at this, this passage today that we're going to kind of open up with and introduce this series, man, just one word just keeps coming back to me, and that is broken. Broken. Man, as I was just standing in the back today, just kind of praying about just, as everybody was worshiping and singing, I was sitting back on the bench in the foyer, and I just began to pray, God, what is it that really needs to be said? Because the reality is, is I don't have any words to give you that are going to do any good. It's the Word of God that you're going to need to hear today. Because when I look around this room, and I look around the community that we live in, and I look around the world, I'm going to be honest, guys, there is brokenness everywhere. We have homes that are just falling apart. They are broken. We have marriages that are hanging on by a thread. They are, they're broken. We have parents who, who are trying to raise kids, and it's just all broken. And, and we have churches in and around our community and all over this world, and they're, they're broken, right? We, we live in a broken world, and we live in that world because of sin. We know why things are broken, but, but how do we take part in rebuilding that which is broken? That's what this series is really going to be about, is how do we rebuild what is broken? Well, you know, my dad is a builder, and I grew up in construction. I really did. Somebody here a while back looked at me and said, when they saw me at my house, I was working, doing some woodworking or something, and they looked, and they're from the church, they're here today. And they said this, they said, I had no idea you were that kind of guy. What does that mean? I didn't know you were a handy guy. I said, just because I have the tools and can put wood together doesn't mean I'm very handy. But anyway, now when it comes to cars, I've told you, if you ever see me on the side of the road and the hood's popped, that is just what men do. I don't really know what's going on off in the engine, okay? I'm just not going to sit in there like a woman and hope another man stops by. I can't do that. But when it comes to construction, I grew up around it. I grew up roofing and building and all of that stuff. And so my dad's a builder. But one of the things I remember 
him always talking about, and, and one of the things I've talked to other builders about, and everybody agrees on this, man, it is so much easier just to start from scratch rather than to remodel something. Have y'all ever remodeled something in your house? Man, what is that about? It's amazing how remodeling one kitchen can take a year, right? I mean, I've got cabinet doors off that I pulled off two years ago. Julie's thrilled, I'm sure, about it, right? I literally pulled out some magnesium out of a cabinet just this week, y'all. It expired, I don't know, probably in the early 2000s. I don't know. There's sawdust in there from my last go at it, right? Remodeling is just painful. It's hard because it's like everything you do, it, it kinda, you have to scotch it onto something that you really don't like, right? You ever notice that about remodeling? My dad would remodel, I remember, and he would always talk about the Yahoo that built the house. You ever do that, Clint? You're like, who built this house? Was he blind? This guy didn't own a level. I mean, I, all these things have been said, right, with more colorful language probably because it was construction. But let me tell you something. This is, this is for free, right? I'm in the medical field. There ain't a construction crew in the world that can hold a candle to the vulgarity of a nurse's station with a bunch of women, okay? But that's a whole other story, right? I'm telling you. That one's for free, all right? But here's the thing. Going and building something new is a lot easier oftentimes than having to remodel and build on something that's kind of broken down. That's just not what it needs to be. And here's the thing. It's a lot of times people choose when they're building a house, they'll kind of look at it. And we kind of did the same thing at Round Prairie, right? We kind of looked at our facilities overall. I didn't even think about this applying, but it does. We looked at all of our facilities, and we talked to the architect, and they looked at kind of what we already had. And they said, look, you could work with this, but it's going to be extremely challenging, and it may not ever be exactly what you want. If you can afford to, it would be a lot better to just build something new. And that works fine in homes. It really does. It works fine for physical buildings. But what do you do when what is broken is your marriage? What do you do when what is broken is your children? What do you, what do, you do when what is, what is broken is something that's dear and near to your heart? What do you do when it's your relationship with your best friend? What do you do in those cases? Well, the reality is a lot of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we just scrap that and we go find something new. That's kind of the world in which we live in. Everything is disposable, including people. It, it's just true, right? I, I hear it all the time. You know, it's like we hold grudges for decades. And, and I think sometimes we are mad at people so long we forget what we're even mad about. Have you ever done that? I hate when that happens. When I've got a really good reason to be mad at my wife, and the next morning I'm like, what was it that I'm supposed to be ticked off about? Hey, you remember, y'all ever do that? I have to think about it, and then I get it again, and I'm like, good, now I'm justified again, right? Am I the only one that's a sinner in the room, right? I'm sorry, it's just true. But what do you do when what is broken needs to be rebuilt, shouldn't be discarded, should be salvaged, I'm going to tell you something. It's harder sometimes to do that. But when we're dealing with the things of God and what God's called and commanded us to do, it's always better. Always. Now, now, when we're talking about different things, I'm not saying that there's not times when it is time to do something new. Just like this building, right? We could continue to add on and and scavenge and do all sorts of stuff. Sometimes it, it is better to just build new. It is. But what do we do on the things that God has already spoken on? What do we do on the things that God has already taught on? What do we do when when it's raising our kids or or, or spouse and we're having issues? What do we do then? I want to tell you something, and I want to clue you in on something. It's harder, but it's better to do the work of rebuilding every single time in those instances. But it's tempting just to discard it and scrap it and start over. Well, in Nehemiah, this particular letter, this book is about Nehemiah, and, and he goes, and, and I'm going to give you a little context, because we don't have a lot of time today. I'm like, how in the world? This sermon could be probably four or five sermons, and you're scared now, but I, I won't keep you real late, okay? But I'm going to give you a little history lesson here so you can kind of catch up to Nehemiah, okay? What's going on in the Old Testament up to this point in time is you had God had called the people of Israel to be a nation, right? They were Jewish people. God called them Father Abraham and many sons and many sons and Father Abraham. That was the father of Israel, right? And through his descendants, God formed a nation. And those Jewish people are 
Israelites, right? And, and they, they had kings, and they had, uh, they had uh, kingdoms, and they had all these cities that, that they belonged to. But in, in the process of all of this, they began to disregard God and call, and call out to other gods and, and, call, and called out to, to false gods and began to worship them. Well, part of God's deal with the Israelites was, as long as you worship me and me alone, I will keep you protected and secured in the land. But if you turn to other gods, I will remove my protection and you will be judged and I will use the nations around you to judge you. Now, I'm going to leave a remnant. There's always going to be a group of you, but you will not be totally wiped out, but I'm going to judge you for your disobedience. And so that's happened. They've, they've followed other gods. And, and in the process of all this, the nation has split on its own into two different kingdoms. You have the northern kingdom and you have the southern kingdom, okay? And so Judah and Jerusalem, that's the southern kingdom, and the other ten tribes up north are, are the northern kingdom. Well, Nehemiah is going to be talking to the southern kingdom because he's been talking to Jerusalem. Well, in the, in the, in, when, when the people were judged, um, the, uh, the, the northern kingdom got judged and taken out by the Assyrian people, and the people in the southern kingdom got taken out by the Babylonian people. And so Babylon is the world power at this point, and they have ransacked all the southern kingdom, and they have destroyed Jerusalem, and they've torn down the temple, they've torn down the walls of the city, which is what was supposed to protect the city, and Jerusalem is just a wreck. Now, in Ezra... Another book here in the Old Testament, we see that he was sent by God to go back to Jerusalem and he rebuilt the temple, right? So the temple's been rebuilt now and God is about to resettle the Israelites in Israel. But first, we find Nehemiah and his story where he's going to be called to go back to repair the walls of the city to make it ready to be inhabited again. And so we're going to kind of read the first few verses of Nehemiah chapter 1, and we're going to kind of observe the person who rebuilds, the one who rebuilds. Like, like what is it, what's the character of a person, and what are the things necessary in someone so that they can rebuild effectively? You, you know, the truth is, I was, I've, always lear- I've learned this over the years, before you can really be effective out there, you've got to have some work done in here. Have you ever noticed that? Before you can ever really make a difference out there, God always wants to make sure the work is done in here first. And so what we're going to look at today are some character qualities of Nehemiah that I believe put him in the right position to be the right man for the job of rebuilding the walls. Okay, so look at the first four verses, and we're going to kind of introduce it this way. It says, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, if you're pregnant, that name's available, okay? In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, y'all know where we're at, right? Kislev, right? While I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, another good name, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem, And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Let's just stop right there, right now. Let's just stop. Four character qualities we're going to kind of pull out of this text about Nehemiah that we should probably look at in our own lives to make sure that we're ready to rebuild whatever it is that's broken in our lives. The first one is this, to rebuild, and we're going to kind of make some application points. To rebuild, you have to be willing. Nehemiah was willing. Well, what do you mean by that, Chris? Well, I've read the whole book, right? So we're going to get a little cheat sheet. We're going to kind of go ahead of the game here. If you follow this book along, you'll see that Nehemiah fully obeys the Lord and and, and sits down and devises the plan, does the work, and ultimately rebuilds the walls in Jerusalem. But the first thing we need to know, if we're going to ever be effective at rebuilding something, you have to be willing to step out and do it. You see, in Nehemiah, if you look at the end of the chapter, in, verse, in chapter 1, you're going to see that he had a certain job in the kingdom. He was a cupbearer to the king. Now, we don't have cupbearers in our day and age in this country usually, but what that basically was was someone who sat next to the king. It was extremely important. They were highly trusted, 
and they were taken care of, but what this person literally did was they tasted the food and the drinks before the king actually did it, just in case somebody poisoned it, right? It's a great job, right? Who wants that job? Especially when you're working for a pretty ruthless king. But Nehemiah has a very significant job. Now, while Nehemiah was born in captivity in Babylon, his homeland is still Israel. It's still Jerusalem. He's never been to Jerusalem, but he knows about Jerusalem. But, but I, want to, I don't want to step over this too quickly, but he does have a pretty important role where he currently is. He's a cupbearer for the king. He's, he's kind of important. He's kind of significant. And I can only imagine, and, and I don't think this is a stretch, and if you study history, you can kind of see this is true, if I'm a cupbearer for the king, if I know somebody's tasting my food to make sure it's not poisonous, and I know they're drinking my drinks to make sure they're not poisonous, I'm going to set them up fairly nicely. Amen? Right? How many of y'all, if you know somebody is going to be tasting your food for the likelihood of poisoning, you're not going to really treat them poorly, right? I want to make sure he's not in on something. I want to make sure that he has a vested interest in me staying alive. And, and so Nehemiah was not only a cupbearer, he was also just a close associate. And so when the king went on vacation, guess who else went to Aspen? I don't think they went to Aspen, but anyway, right? When, when the king's getting delicate delicacies, when everybody else is eating like ramen noodle, he's eating filet mignon, right? I mean, think about it. He's a cupbearer, so he's getting to eat the finest foods of the land. He's getting to go to the entertaining venues. He's sitting there watching all the sports. You know, he's not got a front row seat. He is an incredibly comfortable position. It's an odd position, I'll give you that, but it's a very comfortable position because he is right next to the most powerful man in the world. He's eating well. He's got a place to live. I'm sure it's there in the palace. I mean, Nehemiah had every reason not to want to go back to Jerusalem. If you really think about it, he had it pretty good. I mean, if you're living in a tent outside the city, Jerusalem probably looks just as good. I can live in a tent anywhere, right? But if you're living in the palace, Jerusalem doesn't look nearly as good. They don't even have walls around the city. If they didn't have walls, I'm going to assume the houses were pretty bad shape too. It's probably like Detroit, right? I mean, like, like it's a bad place. But Nehemiah, we're going to see through his story, he was willing to give up anything he had in order to be useful for the work of God in his life. And so he's willing, and, and, and not only that, you're going to follow the story, and this is kind of an introduction, you're going to look at Nehemiah and realize he's not really anything special and from a religious standpoint. Ezra was a priest, so it makes sense that God would call a priest to go back and build the temple. But why is God calling a cupbearer to go back to lead a construction project? You, you see, Nehemiah could have been making excuses, well, I'm not Ezra, I'm not a priest, I'm nothing special but that didn't stop him. He, he was still willing to be used by God. He, he could have stepped back and went, wow, it's terrible that the gates are broken down and the walls are torn down. I hope somebody else will go and do that. But he was willing to be the one that stepped out first. Now, now where am I going with all this? Here's where I'm going. Is I really believe the reason that many people never experience the miraculous work of God in whatever they're trying to rebuild is because most of the time we're waiting on someone else to make the first move. How true is that in our marriages when they're broken? You know what? I, I will be a great husband. I will come through, but she's going to do it first. I, I will care for her, but she's going to submit to me. I'll submit to him, but he's going to love me first. And nobody's willing to make the first move. And you've got to be willing to be obedient to God, even if it means it's not reciprocated. Even if it means you make the first move. Even if it means you have to swallow some of your pride. Even if it means you have to leave a comfortable position. Even if it means that it seems a little unjust, why am I having to do this? Even if, you don't, even if you've never had a great husband, to, to, you know, someone to look out to and say, man, that's how to be a good man, that's how to be a good father, that's how to, how to be a good dad, whatever that is. It doesn't matter. You still have a work to do in your world. And you have to be willing to step up to the plate if God is going to use you to do great things. And so many people, if we're honest with ourselves, we're just not willing. 
We want someone else to make the first move. We make excuses why we can't do it. We make excuses why we're not that important. There's somebody better for the job. There's somebody more qualified for the job. Nehemiah makes no excuses. He's not too busy. He's not, he's not too important. He's, 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 none of that's true. He just simply wants to be faithful. And that's the first peace that you have to have if you're going to be fully obedient to God. And if you're going to see things rebuilt in your life. I can't tell you how many times I've counseled marriage, marriages, and there may be somebody in this room that I've counseled, and if it is, I hope it worked, right? I mean, but here's the thing. I can't, this is one thing I will say to many times in couples, as we get to these impasses where they're like, they're over here and this one's over there, right? And, and you're just, they're just kind of just on each, they're just in a, each one in their own corner, right? And, and you know marriage counseling's not going well, because every, every time that you have someone come in, I'll, I'll just kind of give you a little trade secret here. It's very common when they come in the first time to be sitting on other ends of the couch from one another. That's very common. And I watch this, right? And, and if things are going well, you will notice them over the weeks begin to migrate closer together. But if they're only opposite of the couch six weeks from now, something's not going well. And, and here's what I've noticed. Is it's oftentimes... One of them, they're both waiting on the other one to make the first move. And I finally look and like, look, somebody's going to have to man up and start. And usually that pitting that little competition between them will get them started. But it really will, right? Well, I'm not going to let him have the, you know, he's not going to be able to lord that over me. I'll start first. Well, maybe that's not the right spirit, but let's go, right? And so it works. I'm sorry if I ever manipulated you in that way, but it it works. Somebody has to be the grown-up. Somebody has to say it's worth fighting for. Somebody has to. And I'm going to tell you, when one person begins to do it, and they begin to be fully obedient, it's amazing what God can do in rebuilding what you thought was broken. You have to be willing. Number two, we've got three minutes for the rest of the sermon. This, this just may not happen. I don't know. We'll see. You, to rebuild, you have to see brokenness. In other words, Nehemiah could have never asked about this. And I don't know that Nehemiah was really critically trying to figure out what was broken. But we do know that Nehemiah is interested enough in the state of Jerusalem to at least ask And what I'm getting at is this, Nehemiah was willing to not simply ignore the possibility that things weren't going well, and he was willing to lean in and see if something was truly broken. In order to rebuild, you have to first know that something's broken. Now, this is for marriages primarily in here. This is a good application. I want you to hear this. How many of us honestly never do the hard work of in enhancing our marriage and rebuilding our marriage to be healthy because we don't want to really talk about what might be wrong. I can't tell you how many people have come in over the years, right? I and mean, you've seen them, right? Have, have you ever seen a couple, and, and I'm not trying to be critical, but have you ever seen a couple where, where the wife just, in the middle of the night, just takes off? And the husband says something like, I never saw it coming. And I'm going, you're the only one who didn't see it coming. Like, what I'm getting at is this. Sometimes I think we have a tendency to want to ignore the problems and act like they're just going to go away. If you want to really rebuild anything in your life, you're going to have to have an honest assessment of what's not going well. And I think a lot of marriages would be saved today if we had more conversations early on and didn't wait till everything festered till it blew up. You see, but that's hard, right? It's uncomfortable. I'd rather just stroll through life like nothing's wrong. I'd rather just act like nothing's wrong. Our kids, right, we, we, instead of having the hard conversations when they're young and, and growing, we wait until they're completely off the rails at 19, and then we wonder what to do. I'm not saying there's nothing to do at 19, but you could have saved so much pain at 8. In 9 and 10, when you begin to see these things emerging, you see, you have to be willing to have the conversations, or you have to be willing to go, this is broken, and it's uncomfortable, right? I've got three kids, and, and I, I, we had, we've had conversations. I'm not going to rat them out right here, but I've had conversations with my kids. Look, I would rather you ask me directly. My boys, ask me straight up things that you hear at school, because I'd rather you hear it from an honest source that cares about you than the locker room, Right? 
You can imagine what I'm talking about. And I'm going to tell you all something. There have been some uncomfortable conversations in the last few years. Very uncomfortable. Julie called me one day and goes, you got to talk to your son. Like, why? She goes, I, 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 I can't do it. I'm like, well, what, what did he ask? And she told me, how does he even know that? But here's the thing. Lean into what might be broken, and you will be amazed at how much easier it is to rebuild it. You have to be willing to lean in. When's the last time you checked in with your spouse and said, how am I doing? How are we doing? Churches, right? How many times do people just leave churches, but they never had a conversation with the problem? They never had a pro- their conversation. Like, I've had people, and I tell people this all the time, I invite a conversation before you leave Round Prairie. Not so I can criticize you. I just want to hear. I want to hear what's going on. And there's going to be times that it was a misunderstanding, and, man, I could have communicated that better. That was on me. And there's other times you're just wrong, and, and we'll just land there. But, but, but let's have the conversation and not just, just throw away years of service in a, in a, in a church. I, one, of the, one of the first people I lost here at Round Prairie, when I started as a pastor, he came into my office and he said, look, I want to talk to you. We're going to leave and we're going to another church and here's why. And some of us centered around, they didn't like me and my leadership. And you know what? I would a lot rather have that uncomfortable conversation than to speculate for the next 10 years what went wrong. Now I know it's his fault. No, I'm joking. I'm just joking, y'all. I'm joking, right? But I'm serious. Churches, how often are things broken down because we're not willing to have the hard conversations I hate hard conversations. Betsy calls them crucial conversations. I've learned that. Betsy Wright, that's the counseling edge, right? I used that yesterday. I said, it's time for you to have a crucial conversation. I sounded so intelligent. It was great. I didn't tell them I stole that. But you have to be willing to see brokenness if you're ever going to rebuild. you got to be willing to see it. I know it's time to go. Two more, real quick. I'll do this quick, promise. To rebuild, you have to have conviction. Look at Nehemiah's response. When he sees the walls are broken down and he hears about the walls being broken down, I mean, he says, I sat down and I wept. Why did Nehemiah weep? Nehemiah had never even been to Jerusalem. We don't have any record that he was ever in Jerusalem. It's a good chance he was born in captivity and never there until he went to rebuild the walls. But he weeps over the walls. Why? Because Nehemiah knows the story. He knows that the the Jewish people were created for so much more than where they currently are. He knows that God had made a promise. You see, you see the, the Jerusalem is the emblem to the Jewish people and to really everybody in the world that God is a God who has chosen them. And God is a God who has set them apart. And God is a God who is their God. And, and the walls being broken down is a reminder, a painful reminder, that they have not lived up to the calling of God in their life. It is tragic, and even today, two you know, thousand years after Christ even, and, and even longer since Nehemiah, right, 2,600 years or so, we still know that Jerusalem is a special place, amen? We know that. You don't have to be Jewish to know that there's significance with God and the nation of Israel. It's, it's all through the Bible. We even see later on in, in the New Testament, we see the, the, even at the end of time, the 144,000 Jewish people who God calls up at the end. We know that these are special people that have been called apart for God and they are set apart for God and they are not living up to the potential and the plans that God has for their life. And he weeps when he looks back at the walls. Why? Because he has a deep conviction and passion for what it should look like, for the city that represents all the promises and the goodness of God, and it's broken down. It it makes me think about this idea that sometimes we need conviction in the right areas. You know, even today, like I said, the city's represented as God's promises, but it's really about God's call in their lives. And, And I wonder sometimes if maybe we lack the right convictions is why we don't do the hard work of rebuilding. What I'm saying is this, is one of the things that, um, one of the pieces of advice that Julie and I got over 20 years ago, we've been married over 20 years now, 21. Yeah, I think so. Anyway, 21-ish. It's close, okay? Um, 
but, but one of the pieces of advice I got from so many people is, Chris, and I'm not trying to, like, discourage you. Please don't take this as, you know, if you, if you're, if you had a marriage that's failed, this is not about that. But I'm just going to tell you something about us. One of the pieces of advice we got is you have to have a commitment that this is for the it. This is it. This is a covenant between you and God, and, and you're, 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 you're taking it all the way. That, that's how you've got to enter into this. You can't have a half-hearted conviction about marriage. You have to have a conviction that this is a covenant between you and God. And it's not, it's not if you're going to work it out. It's how are we going to work it out. And I'm going to tell you, there's been some times in 21 years that I'm, I'm not, I didn't really want to work it out. There's been some times in 21 years that I wasn't sure I wanted to see her face tomorrow. And I know she didn't want to see mine. But there was always that conviction going, but you're going to work it out. You're going to work through this. You may not know how right now. You may be hurting right now. You may be confused, scared, whatever. But you were committed to working it out. And that commitment and that conviction has carried us through some times that if I'd have had my brothers, man, I wouldn't be your preacher today, I can tell you that. And I look at what God has done and how God is blessed and what all we possibly would have missed had we gone on our own brothers instead of the conviction that this is for keeps. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I, I, I have times where I just thank God. I'm like, God, thank you. Thank you that you don't let me have my way. Because I told God what I wanted back then. Thank you that you, you didn't let me do something really stupid that I wanted to do. Now, I love those prayers, right? Because they're real. God, thank you. I'm an idiot. Thanks for keeping me from doing it. Thank you for keeping me from acting on my idiocy, God. Because I wanted to. And I'm telling you, the conviction, though, will drive the rebuilding. And so you have to have the right conviction. Well, how do you get the right convictions? Here. This is where you get the right convictions. You, you don't get it from your, your sister or your brother or your, your friend. Your friend's convictions are probably going to be in line with what you want. You have to get your conviction from an objective standard that doesn't change. Because you're going to change. I look better this day than I did 21 years ago. Julie lucked out, right? I could have gotten a little chubby and lost my hair. She signed up. And she got a man that has aged like wine. <laughs> That's pretty bad, yeah. I, that, was a, that was a total joke. There's a lot of sarcasm. Okay, what I'm getting at is this. She didn't sign up if it all went like she planned. She signed up and said, I'm in. Because we believe that our marriage is a covenant, and we're told that by the Word of God, and and she's done nothing, and I've done nothing to, to give us a reason to get out. Even according to God's word, I've, I've done nothing, and she is not either. So we're in it. Not always happy about it, amen, if you're married, right? I can't say how many times I've said I've never loved someone and wanted to slap them so hard at the same time in all my life. And that's not talking about abuse, okay, because she does hit me sometimes, and it hurts. <laughs> She got rowdy yesterday and punched me. I was like, what are you doing? She had a big brother, and I told her, I'm not your big brother. Stop slapping me. But you got to have conviction, right? And, and then lastly, to be rebuild, and this is probably the most key point of all of it, you have to trust God. Not just trust God, but you have to trust God's way. You have to trust God's manner, God's method of life. Look at Nehemiah. After his response of weeping, what does he do? He says, for some days... I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. What does he do when he realizes the walls are broken down? He doesn't run and convene a tribunal and, and get all the greatest architects in the land. He doesn't run straight to the king and go, hey, I, I need a bunch of guys to help me go back to Jerusalem. He doesn't run home and tell all his family what they need. He goes to his knees because he knows if there's ever going to be hope for Jerusalem again, it's going to have to be that God gets involved again. He knows that. So he goes to his knees, and he begins to pray, and he begins to fast. 
He doesn't just weep and mourn. He goes to his knees very strategically, confessing the sins that he has committed, confessing the sins of the people, and saying, God, we need you again. And we're going to talk about the prayer next week. But, but he goes to his knees because he understands that's where the strength is going to be found if he's ever going to rebuild it. Let me tell you something I learned in my marriage. If I was ever going to see God rebuild the things that were broken, or if it was ever going to be rebuilt, I understood one thing. God was going to have to get involved because I didn't have the strength some days. I didn't have the want to some days. And with your kids, right? God's got to get involved. There comes a point when you're raising those little treasures that they raise up and you realize, whoa, they got a mind of their own. And you can't just force them to do everything. They're going to have to choose to follow the Lord themselves. And that is terrifying as a parent. So, so you better get God involved early. Because it is only in him that they're going to be healthy as young adults. It's, it's, it's the only way to do it. But, but you have to understand it's going to have to be in God's power. You have to trust God. He mourns, he fasts, he prays. And it just looks like he does that for a day. Because, but if you look at the passage, we're talking about there's a whole other month in chapter 2 when he stops. And I want to say it's like 40 to 50 days. I can't remember. It's 40 to 50 days later. So he is fasting and on his knees and he's crying out and confessing for weeks upon weeks about this. This is not your average prayer. Bless the food. Bless the meat. Thank you, Lord. Let's eat. This is not that. This is a guy who is pouring out his soul, asking God to do something. I can't tell you how many times over the years, right, we, we've had people come by and, you know, they come in and they're like, I want, I want my marriage, I want my marriage, I want, my kids aren't doing right, or I, 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 my, my finances are not right, or whatever it might be that's broken. I'm not trying to pick on marriages, that's just where some of this is landing. And, and they give it a good few days. Sometimes things are so broken, you just have to fast and fall on your face. Sometimes they're just that broken. I've, I've told y'all this story before, but I'm going to tell you again because a lot of y'all haven't heard it. It's Chris and them come up, and, and this is really personal to me, and, and I want you to hear it from me. Um, when I was a kid, my parents um, were on the verge of getting divorced, and my mom and my dad, my mom was not a believer. My dad was out of church for decades, and we, didn't, I, we went to church occasionally, right? Uh, we were talking about Easter Christians. We weren't even Easter Christians every time. It was just like, we knew, I knew what church was, but that was about it. I just knew you had to wear a seersucker suit from Sears. And that's all I knew. Anybody else have a seersucker suit from Sears? Anyway, I did. Still got it. No, I'm joking. I don't. But, um, but my mom, just in a last-ditch effort, went and visited this little church, and she came to know Christ as her Savior that night. And I still, and I know I've shared this, but it's just, it's just every time it gets me. Um, and she changed. I mean, when you're talking about a change in someone, it was just like that. It's just a radical change in her heart. I mean, I, and if she was here, you would never know it. Some of y'all know my mom. She's all meek and passive. She could launch some stuff across the living room. Right? She, she, was, she was something. She used to chase her sisters around with a butcher knife, and they'd lock her out of the house when she was a kid. My mom was like feral. She was like a feral cat. She was. So when Jesus got a hold of her, he got a hold of her. And, and you took this woman who had been just fighting and agging it on and just, 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 just not trying to heal anything in her marriage. And you took the volatility of my parents, and you, you just had them as volatile I remember that, right? I remember that growing up some. But then this switch happened, and I watched her. She got a Bible, and she began to just open it up. And in her closet, she would fall on her knees and just weep. Just weep. Over the pages of Scripture, they're just wrinkled from her tears, some of them just crying out, God, heal my marriage. Heal my marriage. Heal my marriage. 
And I walked in there and I was seeing her on her knees. And um, I guess they're coming up on 50 years in a couple of years. Why do I tell you that? Because I think if we're not careful, we think that our situation's too dark. It's too bleak. People are we're just too far gone. I can't promise this will happen. But I will tell you this. In over 20 years of ministry, I've seen people say they're going to go pray, they're going to go do this, they're going to go do that, and I've seen their marriages fail. But never have I seen one go to their knees like that and God not restore it. I've seen marriages that I thought, man, if God doesn't, it's gone. Like, I didn't want to say that. Like, I'm like, I'll counsel with y'all next week. But inside, I'm like, there is no way unless God does something. And I've seen him do it over and over and over again. He can rebuild what is broken in your life. He can rebuild it. Relationships that you never thought would heal, God can heal them. But you have to go to the scriptures and decide to do it his way moving forward. You see, it's easy to pray, 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 and then still be disobedient. That's not what we're talking about. When my mom's down on her knees and she began to pray, she began to learn what it meant to be a, a wife. And she looked at this idea of submission that so many women squirm at. And so many, I'll be honest, so many women say, well, if he'll be this, I'll be that. Let me tell you, that's nowhere in Scripture. If he'll be a godly leader, I'll submit. That's nowhere there. You've got a role to fulfill, and that's your obedience to God, whatever he does. And husbands, whether she's nagging you every day, you've got a job, and that's between you and God, to love her like Christ loved the church. And that's a pretty good illustration because we're pretty crummy to Christ sometimes. But he still keeps pouring his love on us. But she began to read what it looked like to be a submissive wife. And she didn't just pray and, and ask God. She began to live out the scriptures of a submissive wife to a man who did not deserve it. And over time, the love and the submission began to turn the heart of a husband to God. That's what the scriptures are talking about. That's why we do it. We are in this together to point each other to Christ. So if you want to rebuild something, know this. God has got to get involved. So we're going to have a time of invitation. Y'all go ahead and stand. And I know it's late, but I just, I'm not going to apologize. I just feel like God wanted this done today. If you're visiting, this is not common, so don't freak out. But if you've got something in your life that needs to be rebuilt, I want to encourage you right where you are at this altar, begin to cry out to God to help you rebuild it. I want you to surround yourself with other believers who are for you and for what is for healing what is broken in your life. Surround yourself with godly people who can help spur you along in the healing. I mean, God surrounded me with some godly men in some of that season of my life where I was not sure about my marriage, and they looked at me straight up and said, You're an idiot. What are you doing? You know better. God, God, you need people around you. And we're going to learn that about Nehemiah as well. But if there's something broken, I want to encourage you to pray right where you are. Come to this altar. If you're here, and maybe what is broken is the fact that you've never accepted Christ. Maybe the story of my mother is a testimony that, hey, that's the first thing that's wrong, is you don't have Christ in you. And let me tell you, that's the first step, is to have Christ in you so that the love of Christ can flow from you. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, this is the time that I want to invite you to come down and accept Him. But any way that God's moving today, I want to encourage you just to respond. Let's sing, let's worship, and do business with God.